Okay, it's 10.30, so over to Doug. All right, good morning. So I'm Doug Way. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'll be speaking first today, and the other speakers we have are Tommy Doyle from Elsevier and Bob Nardini from ProQuest. Um, we're each going to speak, and then we'll do a question and answer at the end. Uh, we try to leave plenty of time for question and answers or snide comments. Um, so I'm here to share the librarian's viewpoint about changes we're seeing in the book industry around consolidation. And I'll primarily be speaking about uh, consolidation around book jobbers there. Um, and so I guess, you know, to start out, it was interesting when I, when it was announced that, you know, EBSCO had acquired YBP, I texted a friend and I said, you know, I'm not prepared to say this is a bad thing, but it's certainly not good. And then I cracked a joke about when ProQuest will buy Coots next. Um, <laughs> month, months later, you know, especially in light of the cons continued consolidation of the library marketplace, I still struggle to see much good coming from these changes in the long run. In the short term, however, I've seen little bad coming of these mergers. The biggest complaints I've heard from my library, from other libraries, around change of addresses um, for billing. So not that big of a deal. And I've also heard a lot of positives around uh, greater investment technology. Certainly, both ProQuest and EBSCO have a history of developing resources and systems that are relied on by us and our users. They have created innovative tools to solve problems, such as in the area of discovery, and they even sometimes listen to us, creating changing practices or products in better ways to serve us and our users. In press releases, they tout their commitment to libraries, to users, openness and efficiency, and they tell us how great these acquisitions are. So what could go wrong? Well, lots. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes discussing what you could call a parade of horribles. But before I talk about our industry, I think it might be useful to look at an example from another marketplace. Right around the time I was asked to talk at this session, I saw an article in the New York Times that outlined how Amazon's no longer selling Apple TV or Google's Chromecast. So here we have an industry that claims to have the customer's best interest in mind. Certainly Jeff Bezos has made that a mantra, yet his company, Amazon, won't sell me a Chromecast or Apple TV. And my Apple TV won't let me access Sling TV. And if I want to watch Downton Abbey, I'm out of luck on Netflix because that's exclusive on Amazon. Or if I want to watch Seinfeld, well, I have to have a subscription to Hulu. So how does this relate to libraries and these mergers? Like Amazon or Netflix or Hulu, ProQuest and EBSCO are regularly engaged in practices that appear to limit choices, options, and competition. Yet they say they're committed to and care about their customers. And on the one hand, I really believe they do. If you think about it, their business model are predicated on developing resources and services that meet the needs of libraries and our users. But they're also here to make money. Now, I want to be clear, I don't have a pro problem with for-profit companies. Frankly, in our industry, I prefer working with them over many of the society or faux nonprofit companies that operate in our industry. But the fact they are for profit is a reality and it shows in their actions. Again, these are companies that say they're committed to our users, yet they proudly strike exclusive deals with publishers. These deals don't impact my ability to access Seinfeld, but they do impact my users' ability to access the Wall Street Journal, the Harvard Business Review, and any other number of titles. And then they agreed absurd terms imposed on them by publishers like the Harvard Business Review. Now they tell us it's not them, it's the publishers. And it's the libraries that insist on access to these resources regardless of publisher restrictions. These are companies that say they're committed to openness. Yet some of these companies still fence off and refuse to share metadata with other web scale discovery services. Instead they build systems that force you to use their products on their platform for optimal performance. These are companies that say they're committed to libraries, yet regularly raise prices at rates that really only a European STEM publisher could appreciate. Rates that are two to three times that of the CPI. When you ask them to explain why, they explain, it's not us, it's the publishers. And it's the, pub the publishers of those journals that librarians insist that they, they license on our behalf. I was told this by one of these companies recently, so I asked, well, why are my A&I databases seeing that same rate of increase if they have no full text? I was told that's because of the high quality indexing done here in the United States. I suppose I really shouldn't complain because in other instances we don't even get absurd excuses and we certainly don't get an honest answer to our questions. Instead, we're just told that they'll adjust the price this year. So these are companies that say they're committed to efficiency, yet they want us to bundle and group purchases in such ways that makes it difficult to cancel or split apart. The real reality is these companies want as much of our collections dollars running through them as possible. They tell us, don't pay for that journal package directly. We'll reduce or even eliminate that service charge for this package. 
or they'll say, don't get that database through your consortia, we'll give you the better pricing. So, and if all that sweet talk doesn't work, then come the threatened consequences. And that's what concerns me with these mergers. When I have options, I have power. I can make choices, I can play vendors off each other, I can walk away. But what do I do when YBP locks up JSTOR and exclusive and Project Muse content's only available from Coots? What do I do when my discounting rate is affected by any adjustments I make to my approval plan? What do I do when eBrary content becomes a second class citizen to YBP and the same thing happens to EBSCO eBooks on Coots? What do I do when all of a sudden my database subscri subscriptions are entangled with my journal subscriptions which are intertwined, intertwined with my monograph acquisitions? What do I do when my book jobber and my ILS provider decide they won't work together anymore? What do I do when one of these companies goes out of business? I currently send a massive amount of my collections budget through these two companies. And I feel like I'm being forced to put all my eggs in one basket. How do I keep my budget from being cracked, scrambled, or fried? Now, none of these terrible things have happened yet. But unlike the stock market, this is an instance where I really think past performance is an indicator of future performance. And that's what concerns me. So I want to leave that positivity behind for a moment and think about the potential positives that these mergers hold. What do I want to see? What do I hope to see? Well, I hope we'll see jobbers that are more open to new ideas. I hope we'll see companies that will innovate, that will blow my mind with capabilities I never thought of or never even considered. I want these companies to be technologically advanced. I want them to be able to handle the complexity of how we want and how we need to acquire content in the 21st century. I want them to make my life easier, to save us time, and to make us more efficient. And I want them to work with others and play nice with others. In order to do that, I need them to be Switzerland. I need them to be Roku. I really need them to be neutral. I want to be able to say to publishers and aggregators that I need you to work with my jobber. But if my jobber's not neutral, how am I supposed to do that? From where I sit, EBSCO and ProQuest are competitors that don't necessarily get along and don't seem keen on neutrality or cooperation. The reality is when you have to issue press releases to reassure us that you will continue to cooperate with each other, that is not at all reassuring. <laughs> For I'm sitting, I don't see two companies committed to cooperation. I see two companies that are quick to point the finger at anyone other than themselves that seem intent on tearing down the other and let us know not what is good about their products and their services, but what is wrong with their competitors. Perhaps I'm wrong, and that will not be the case with YBP and Coots. I hope that's not the case. But if we're going to go back to that past, past performance thing, not so sure. So as I wrap up, I said just a few thoughts for the different groups that I hope are out there today. To publishers and ebook aggregators, I would just say don't do it. Don't agree to exclusives with YBP or Coots. I don't care what they tell you. I am much less likely to purchase your content if it's not available for my jobber, nor am I inclined to add yet another jobber into the mix. Trust me, I work with a lot of them. Exclusives make it harder for me to work with you. If you want my money, make it easier for me to work with you. And to ProQuest and EBSCO, if you don't like the portrait I've painted today, it's a pretty simple solution. You know, change the practice, change what you're doing. And if you're truly committed to libraries and neutrality, it's also simple. Prove it. Show me through your actions today, tomorrow, and into the future. For now, I'm dubious, doubtful, and negative. But prove me wrong, not through words or press releases, but through your actions. And finally, to the librarians, I, I, I think I was supposed to, if you look at the, the program, I think I was supposed to discuss the positive outcomes of this consolidation. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could stand up here and tell you all the great things that were going to come out of this for libraries. I wish I could stand up here and share my optimism about all the synergies that were going to come about. I wish I could tell you that how ProQuest acquisition of Ex Libris was going to make things even better, but I can't. I wish I could tell you that I didn't think we'd start being nickel and dime for things that were just part of our service in the past, but I can't. I wish I could tell you how easy it is to move approval plans or tech specs from one vendor to the other, that every vendor has the exact same capabilities as these large vendors that if the parade of horribles comes to be that you could easily walk away, but I can't. What I can tell you is that these companies want our business and they have certain, we have certain levers at our disposal. And even if you're a small library, you have leverage. So we need to use our voice, express our concerns, share our experiences with our colleagues at other libraries, push back about against bad practices and negotiate better terms. I mentioned somewhat facetiously before about how these companies sometimes listen to us, but they really do. Um, it's the truth. But the reality is you have to speak up first. The other level we have that we need to use is the power of the purse. And while you should use your voice, I promise you this will get your, their attention even faster. I completely understand it's not easy to walk away, and I understand the efficiencies that come from running monograph acquisitions through one vendor. At the same time, at a certain point in time, you have to say no more. So to try and close on a 
things, looking at things optimistically in comparison to the insanity that is the journal marketplace, we have a lot of options here. So use your voice, use your dollars. Grumbling behind closed doors does no good, nor does blindly accepting price increases year after year. We owe it to our users to make our limited budget dollars go as far as possible, and we owe it to each other to push back against and to use our dollars to hold vendors accountable for bad practices. If we don't do these things, then we are equally culpable and have no one to blame but ourselves. Thank you. Tommy? I knew we shouldn't have let Doug go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was asked to be on this panel for two reasons. One is because years ago, in an earlier round of mergers in, in, uh, in, academic, in the business of academic libraries, I came up with the best program title at an ALA ever. It was called Merger, She Wrote. <laughs> so, I'm here, so I'm here for that reason. But I'm also here because over my career, which has been entirely in the book side of the business, and that's the point of view from which I'll talk, because that's what I know. I've been in, I've been in, I've have uh, worked at companies that have been acquired or merged with a larger company four different times in my career. And I've also worked for a company that acquired, acquired a smaller company too. So I've seen the transaction from the inside from both of those points of view. Now, I started in the book business in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, a long time ago. And here are some names from that era that some of you might recognize. And if you do, you're, uh, you're, you're telling something about your age. Albion, Taylor Carlisle, academic, scholarly, Franklin, and more recently, Bookhouse, Everett's, Lindsay and Howes that became Lindsay and Croft, and then Coots. Coots is the company I've worked for most recently, and Coots was uh, acquired some years ago, a few years ago by Ingram, and now the company, the division I work for within ProQuest, ProQuest Books, is comprised of our ebook division and what had been Coots, the print book, print and ebook division. So. The major point I'm making here is that the consolidation and mergers that were is the subject of our talk today is nothing new in the book, in the business of academic book selling. In fact, if you trace the beginning of the academic book business to, to its start, you have to start with the Richard Abel Company, famed Richard, legendary Richard Abel Company out of Portland, Oregon. Abel went, uh, was, began in the late 60s, folded under financial distress in the 70s, was acquired by Blackwell's, and that was the basis of Blackwell North America. And that company had a pretty good long run, I think most of us would agree, until being acquired by YBP, who at that point had themselves been acquired by Baker and Taylor, and more recently has been acquired by EBSCO. So the story we're talking about today is an old story. That's one of my points. It's not new the consolidation, the mergers, the acquisitions that we're, that we're witnessing today. Now, I mentioned having worked for a company in, that acquired a smaller company. That was back in the 90s when YBP acquired, I was working at YBP at the time, acquired the British company, Lindsay and & Howes. And I was actually the first person from YBP to visit Lindsay & Howes in, their, in the town of Godalming, Surrey, in the UK, and they had a cottage that was completely Dickensian. I remember walking in there and trying to go up to the second floor where Miriam Lindsay and Bernard, Bernard Howes did their profiling, did their work. They had the British National Bibliography, the latest issue, spread out on the table, catalogs and books everywhere. I had to wend my way through the books on the way on the staircase on the way up to the second floor. So that was Lindsay and Howes. And I remember Miriam Lindsay saying to me one time, you know, Bob, I had one of our Largest, our largest customer, and this is a prestigious library, uh, still a very prestigious library, an academic librarianship, who was a Lindsay and Howes account, a flagship account for Lindsay and Howes. Miriam said to me, you know what they said to me? They said, we were very unhappy. We were, un un we were distressed to hear about the acquisition uh, of, Lind of Lindsay and Howes. And I said back to them, this is Miriam talking, you know why we did it? We did it because of you. You needed us to do technical services cataloging, processing, shelf-ready books. I don't know where they would have put the cataloging equipment, the, pro the spine label equipment in that cottage that I witnessed in Godalming. Miriam's aged father worked in an enclosed porch 
out in the back with a table where she wrapped up the books in boxes and sent them on their way. So there's no way that Lindsay and Howe's, lovely as it was to deal with them, and as a boutique kind of vendor, could have carried out the responsibilities that libraries needed uh, uh, their vendor to perform. So I mentioned, as I said earlier, this is not anything new. And the merger, when, when I said merger, she wrote, I mean, some of the acquisitions going on right then, one was uh, the Faxon, Rocom, Divine situation, which I'm sure most of you re remember, and things didn't work out so well there for anybody. But the other was YBP having been acquired by Baker and Taylor at, that at roughly that same time. And so that, you know, YBP is still going pretty, pretty strong, so far as I know. So I think you can look at mergers and acquisitions in a couple of different ways. And all those names I mentioned, you could probably categorize them roughly into uh, arrangements where there was a long-term strategic gain of one kind or another by the two companies coming together versus a short-term or shorter-term financial transaction only where some growth was being looked for or uh, purely a financial transaction without any kind of strategic value to it. You can probably think of most of those acquisitions, those mergers in one way or another weighted differently of those two types. But Lindsay and Howe's being able to perform, uh, perform, not being able to perform cataloging and processing, and that is just one of the library processes brought together under a single company, and that was an early example. So technical services, you needed a larger company to be able to do it. You needed the expertise, the resources, the capital to be able to carry it off. I, we could also talk about discovery, starting with librarian discovery. The first vehicle I remember for librarian discovery or bibliographic information was monthly sets of microfiche that we would mail out to our customers every month. And we mailed them out for uh, well into the digital era, actually, before that stopped and was replaced by a Telnet service, which lasted a few years. And then that, in turn, was replaced by uh, a web-based interface that uh, still is the way librarians, academic librarians learn about and order the books that they need. So librarian discovery, we, and then we could move on to patron discovery, where a vendor needs to have relationships with uh, the discovery service providers in order to help the library carry out their mission of making their, making their content used. All, while those services are going on, you have the, uh, the evolution of print and e-books as they cohabit the book selling world. And there's all kinds of dynamics going on there in terms of models, pricing, availability, and so on and so forth. And you need uh, companies with a lot of resources to be able to make the sorts of things happen that make an academic librarian's job possible to do. With all the demands on all of you who are librarians in the room, you need and you've asked for a company that can provide services from this point to that point across the whole spectrum of what of your mission as academic libraries. So one, so rather than have a fragmented marketplace where different companies do different things and you have to have relationships with different sorts of companies and you hope that they work together to carry off whatever it is you need to be carried off, much, much easier if under one roof there's a company with the parts that could be put together in a way that will create a truly integrated and seamless world, and if we're talking about book acquisitions and discovery and use by patrons, and not a fragmented marketplace, which is what we've mostly experienced over the years that I'm talking about. And I'll just close by saying one thing, and this is in response to one of Doug's points, and that is, in the book world, as opposed to other parts of the academic uh, library business, it'd be really hard to find uh, too many examples, if any, of content where any of us have a monopoly on that content. Almost always, I think it's hard to think of an example otherwise, librarians can get access to content some other way, usually a multiple number of ways to get access to that same content. So we're not in the same sort of position that might be true in other parts of academic uh, librarianship because we don't have that kind of monopoly on the content that librarians need. So thank you, and I'm gonna turn it over to Tommy. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Bob. Um, so just a quick introduction to me. I, my name is Tommy Doyle. I'm responsible for uh, strategy and business development for Elsevier uh, Science and Technology books. 
Um, I, my background is actually not in publishing. I spent most of my early career in strategy and investing. Uh, and I used to help everything from investment banks, um, uh, big media companies, pharmaceuticals, and uh, even the odd utility help uh, manage their capital, where to allocate their precious resources for maximum uh, shareholder impact. M&A um, was a really important uh, tool for companies to either buy new capabilities, get scale, uh, grow revenues, get into new markets. Uh, but also, if you look at any of the literature or studies out there, uh, mergers and acquisitions are usually incredibly unsuccessful. The success rate of mergers and acquisitions is only about 25% from an economic perspective. Um, one of the things that makes uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions successful is a very strong strategic fit. So what we try to do, and all the co companies that I've worked with that have been successful at M&A have ones that have been very uh, prescriptive about how and why they acquire companies and merge and do alliance with companies rather than be opportunistic and, and, and take, up, take up assets as they become available. Um, when I sort of step back and look at the books market overall, it's, it is highly fragmented. Uh, it is a market that is in decline, um, and it's also a market that's going through a massive transition from print to digital. Uh, and so that does serve up many, many opportunities for consolidation. So companies that are trying to go from print to digital, companies that are trying to maintain profits uh, in a declining market, um, mergers uh, and acquisitions and alliances become very, very important to businesses. Um, so I joined the s and Books about three and a half years ago. Um, I'm an ex-scientist and I've always been very interested in academic publishing. I'm a failed chemist, so don't look me up. But, um, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I came into Elsevier and, I, and I, I sort of did the usual strategic questions. I said, so what are we good at? What are we good at? And, and often these acquisition editors or publishers would point to individual titles, very proud, great authors, great science. Um, but it was very hard to see the wood from the trees. You know, what's the investment thesis here? What's the portfolio that I would have at Roche Lifecycle Committee or at Barclays Credit Risk Team? Um, and, and when I sat in a lot of these book proposal meetings, which I imagine is quite similar to some of your acquisition uh, meetings that you have when you're planning your collections, um, I was, first of all, I was totally blown away by the science. I mean, some of the stuff that these guys are doing is just mind-blowing. But then I started the, 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 the strategic investment training in me, started to think, well, actually, a lot of the ways that we're picking and choosing titles is, is based on whether the acquisition has a good editor, had a past performance track record, or how they would rig a financial model to guess how many print books were being made. And as a result of those types of decisions, people were making less and less decisions to invest in uh, signing authors, and often uh, titles were focused on revisions of old work. And when you think about science, it's growing all the time, it's expanding, it's getting more chaotic, and the need for reference content is really important. Um, so the other thing that kind of struck me was, you know, we weren't bringing enough data into these investment decisions, because a book, a book acquisition a proposal meeting is just like a VC committee, or a loan committee, or a life cycle committee. Uh, people propose an idea or for an author, uh, and a, a financial model is made, a decision is made, and you basically wait five years or ten years to see if you make a good return on that investment. So one of the things that struck me was we're not really taking advantage of lots of data that we have available to us. Um, so what we started off doing was we actually build an investment model, um, and being part of a big company like Elsevier, there's actually lots of really good tools and data available to help you build that investment thesis. So we took all the bibliometrics and data coming out of tools like Scival and Scopus. We, we, we massively mined uh, the billion eyeballs going through Science Direct every year. And we basically built an investment thesis to say, what are the subject areas that we're going to focus on that are big and fast-growing and well-funded, but also, more importantly, where Elsevier has a strong position? So I don't want to make loads and loads of more books just for the sake of making more books for the sake of making money, because um, you know, that, that any, anybody can sort of play the Costco model. Really, I wanted to see I, every unit of information, every researcher that we took off the bench to write a book, I wanted that to be ultimately valuable, and I wanted to fit that into a broader portfolio. So we built the model, uh, and we plotted it out, and we basically identified nine big subject areas that are both faster growing and where we have an overall strong competitive position. And over the last five years, that has really guided significantly our investment uh, organically, reallocating acquisition editors to those areas, um, and also our acquisition and divestment strategy. Uh, because actually, when I think about strategy, it's about making choices. I mean, despite being a big, you know, massive STEM publisher, the books publishing it is pretty small, and our resources are very constrained. And actually, that's quite a good thing when you have constrained resources, because it forces you to make choices. 
And so we sold lots of things. We also bought lots of things. And, 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 and where, we, where we really, really, like, as we start to evaluate assets, we really start to think, really, does it fit the investment thesis? Does it fit one of our nine big subject areas that we're going after? Does the content itself pad or does it add? So there's, we, we, we constantly are challenging ourselves to say, are we just getting Me Too titles? Are we just simply bulking up the collection? Or actually adding something significantly different that we couldn't acquire or uh, ourselves so when I say acquire, sign ourselves quickly or efficiently, um, and uh, and is this also are, this, are these great high quality authors, and is this really important science that will ultimately help build the breadth and depth and currency in the in the subject areas we want to be really valuable. So um, I think uh, in terms of our, our M and A strategy, it's not a financial one; it's an incredibly strategic one. So we've done probably I think probably now 14 transactions over the last three and a half years. So we've taken about 30% of our business, which was in the areas of the portfolio that we wanted to be in, and now 75% are in these really important strategic areas. And the remaining pieces of our business are actually starting to align uh, also in more sort of interdisciplinary or support aligned type verticals. This is the subject areas we call verticals. Um, and you know, a couple of examples, we acquired Woodhead Publishing. Food science is a massive, I'm sure you guys know, is a massively growing important area, and an area that Elsevier hadn't really been big in the book side. So buying Woodhead uh, allowed us to get access to a lot of good authors, a lot of good content, and a fantastic editorial team with deep subject matter expertise and, and intimacy with the community, and we've significantly grown our position in food science. Material science was another area which we're investing in significantly, and Woodhead helped us build a stronger position. They brought different types of material content, so more applied content rather than just the pure basic science of, of, of material science, which was great. Um, so I think um, that, that kind of bringing data and decision making and being very, very specific about what we add. We, we don't pad, we add to add ultimate value to the end user and the researcher. Um, the second area, uh, which we're, I'm not really acquiring right now, but um, because it's hard to make the case, is we're doing lots of work with startups and technology companies. Um, unfortunately, um, it's quite difficult to do venturing within, uh, within big companies. Um, often, big companies need to have a proof of, a proof of revenue, proof of um, business success. And, then, and there's a lot of great startups out there trying to do different things with content to add more impact to the researchers. Um, so we're doing lots and lots of work, signing strategic alliances and partnerships with these. One of the ones we're about to sign is with a company called Protocols.io. Protocols.io is an amazing app. It's an open access, uh, it's an open access map that basically breaks up a protocol that's in an article or in a book, and it puts it on an iPhone so you can take the, your iPhone into your fume hood in the lab and just flick through and time and video. And, and ultimately, what that does, it makes our content more valuable. So, um, and the other thing that it does, it creates a lot of data. So rather than just we're all talking about clicks and users, we'll actually be able to see real lifetime data of how many people are doing these ac actually experiments and where the experiments are going wrong. And the lovely thing also about the platform, it allows people to update the content. So it's an open source, free, avail available uh, resource for researchers, and they can actually write their notes and share their notes. Again, this is a new type of technology, and we're partnering uh, maybe one day acquiring, I don't know, we'll acquire protocols.io, but, but, but learning, with, learning with technology companies again. So I think in summary, what we're trying to do from an M&A perspective is really align our portfolio in a very, very specific way. So not being opportunistic, but being very, very tactical, very strategic about making sure we're, we're bringing content in that we couldn't sign ourselves or getting access to authors or, or groups or specialists that we couldn't have ourselves. Um, and also... Um, bringing in, um, partnering a lot with technology companies that can actually ultimately make the content more valuable to the end user um, and hopefully also create better data for us to make better publishing decisions. Thank you.
Well, it's a challenge, Charles, but also an opportunity, and I'm, I'll speak from what I know. Uh, so one of the things I've spent a lot of my time on in recent years is the Oasis acquisitions interface for books that, that our customers at Coots have used. And we've already, and, and so it's a challenge, it, it's challenging but also exciting and an opportunity to think about how we will be able to at ProQuest create an integrated print and ebook workflow that makes a lot of sense and that saves time and effort and money and frustration on the part of all of you who are librarians in the room. Now that's down the road a little bit to truly integrate our legacy system with uh, the new system being released at ProQuest for eBooks and to tie them together in sensible ways. But we already see ways that we can begin to take advantage of that leg legacy system with data that we, as everyday data for us that we use and provide and, and update that the newer system at ProQuest, eBook Central, does not as yet have. So series information, the book is in such and such a series. We have better control over series than eBook Central does. New edition, second edition, third edition, fourth edition, that's bread and butter for us. So we have a legacy system that can inform uh, our sister, our partner system within ProQuest. Ebook dates, ebook dates are a source of a lot of frustration for many of you in the room probably. An old ebook, excuse me, old content is newly christened as an ebook and very often the publisher assigns a new date to it. Well, that's not the true date of the content. Uh, the, as a, in our Oasis, system, we know when that print book was published, when that content was born, and we can help to make our sister system, which is, has been focused on ebooks, uh, more accurate in its description of the age of content. So a challenge, but also an opportunity, Charles, would be my summary. Yeah, I think for us, um, very slowly and very carefully is, is what we, we do. So um, Woodhead particularly, they had their own platform. Um, and uh, what we do as a principal, we recreate everybody's holdings on Science Direct, uh, and we monitor uh, usage of the old platform. And when it comes down to a certain level, uh, we then sunset that platform. Uh, but it's always very he well communicated and signpost. As I said, lots of our, our acquisitions in books aren't less up with but they're, the value driver from a financial perspective is not cost. Um, it's ensuring that we have the right content that meets researcher needs uh, and adds rather than pads to our collection. So um, we don't necessarily have the big pressure to, to cut things off and save costs straight away. And to be honest, um, uh, a lot of people, the, a lot of these uh, smaller publishers with their less developed platforms, um, the, the content sings and, and, and flows and, and, and is more discoverable on, on Science Direct. So, but we still, we're still very, very careful because that's the last thing you want to do is uh, people need to find the content, people need to use it, the people have to get used to finding it on a different site. Uh, so very, very slowly, very, very carefully. I'd like to take, Dan, the, uh, that old creaky legacy system that uh, Charles introduced <laughs> and repurpose certain parts of it, which today the, the, the book interface is aimed at librarians, library staff, librarians, selectors who do that work, selection and acquisition. I would like to see our resources, our interfaces somewhat redirected toward the researchers, Dan, that you just uh, you just referred to, so that there were portals aimed at that part of the university community and not solely at the library. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that DDA, PDA, the, that world that has emerged in the last, I don't know, 
eight, ten years, five, ten years, whatever, whatever it's been, is trying to do that, is trying to put selection responsibility in the hands of the, dis in, of the uh, communities that you just referred to, Dan, but it's still based on a MARC record, a library interface. It's not an interface designed specifically to the needs of the members of the university community, Dan, that you just referred to. I, I think it's, you know, as a publisher, we should, you know, really support and um, encourage, I mean, I don't want to get in the way of scientists having important conversations and sharing ideas. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we acquired Mendeley. It's one of the reasons I'm doing partnerships with uh, firms like Protocols. Um, I think, um, I mean, one thing that's very valuable, um, you know, as people talk more and share more and that creates data that allows us to work out what we should be publishing and what kind of services we should be providing. So um, I think the more, more that that goes on, the more signals that, that come out from that, that activity and, and publishers and, and providers and librarians should be learning from those and building services and products that match those needs. I think uh, from library standpoint, I think sometimes we see disintermediation as a bad thing. I think actually it's a good thing. We, the fact that our scholars don't realize they're using library resources and they go Google search and they get to that article they need, that's that's great. Um, makes it a little hard to tell our story, but you know, what I really want to take advantage of those things is to make it easier for us to acquire this content, make it easier for us to get our hands on this content. I want my librarian spending less and less time doing selection for what we, uh, I think Rick Anderson described as commodity collections, those collections from Western Europe and North America there. I want them spending more time on those things that are hard to get their hands on, whether it's from Africa or South Asia or from the indie publishers that um, just don't hit the mainstreams. Um, and I want them out of the library instead of picking up what books to buy, I want them out working with faculty, making their lives, making them more effective there and looking at other roles there. Just one thing that I'd say, you know, Tom talked about, you know, Mendeley acquisitions. I think what's happening though is publishers are making it harder for researchers in many ways and I don't want to pick on Elsevier, but nice. I think Elsevier's new uh, copyright transfer agreement where it makes it very difficult for uh, faculty or for researchers to use their scholarship they created in the ways that they want to do it. It's putting, forcing them essentially into Mendeley and all these other styles they want. It's, you're forcing them to essentially violate their agreements. You're gonna do it anyways, but what's happening now is when you're saying that it has to be, you can put your Elsevier published articles in where we say you can put them to share them. Mm. That really does actually limit the conversations that happen among scholars there. It's a real concern that I think we have. Right, yeah. No, I mean, certainly from a, um, a books publishing perspective, um, you know, I think it's just good business economics to make your book as broadly available. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of, um, of selecting places where people want to buy their content. So, I mean, it's our broad digital strategy is to make our, our stuff as uh, available as possible. So we're in 96 or plus different digital channels, uh, uh, broadly accessible. Um, so multiple business models uh, that people can get access to that content and uh, obviously we all know discoverable. Um, in fact, uh, you know, one thing that's really interesting is um, the average revenue of our front list is, has gone down quite a lot while our usage has gone up significantly and that's been a wonderful benefit of making business models more flexible. And if, we, if, if, if books become more better distributed, from my perspective, who's sort of the data investment guy, more, more accessibility, well, firstly, it's great for science, so our authors are getting, getting read, uh, they're getting used, science is working properly. And then uh, secondly, I also get more data back uh, from the people sharing and accessing that content um, so I can make better product decisions to so ultimately you know, be more selective and you know, I, I don't want to make books that aren't going to be read, I want to make books that are going to be used and ultimately push, push the ball forward. I'm Bob Schatz. Uh, I work for a publisher now, but for 35 years I worked for half of the extinct companies that Bob named um, in book selling. So this is a kind of a subject that is painfully near and dear to my heart. Uh, it, it is a comment, or, or a set of comments that I'm not sure is gonna enlighten anybody that much. It, when I was at Academic Book Center, our business structure was such that we were required yearly to go through an official audit. And they'd always send these, these young new accountants out to us to do the audit, and I could almost set my watch by the day and moment when 
And at this point, my boss, Dan Halloran, would lock his doors. They'd, they'd come into my office, kind of glassy-eyed, and look at me and say, it, it makes no sense. Um, and from an official business standpoint, they were absolutely right, because we had so few economies of scale that it was a, a labor of love more than a, a, a labor of, of true profitability. Once upon a time, in the Richard Abel era, what we're talking about was in an environment, an economy of plenty. New libraries were being built, new universities were being launched, great society money was going into, into libraries. Uh, and book selling and jobbing came into existence largely because libraries said, we can't keep up with this plenty anymore, we need somebody to help us manage this economy of scale and Richard Abel started and, and you know things went down the road. We now very much, as we all know, in libraries and in, in book selling and publishing and everything else, are in an economy of scarcity where the amount of information that's being produced, the amount of research that's being done far outpaces any resources that the libraries have to acquire materials, whether they're physical books or digital books, and that that kind of forces those who are within the marketplace to just find ways to be more efficient. And it, it does two things. From the consumer side, it's very normal behavior in economies of scarcity to ask for more and more services because you need to, in libraries, to make your dollar go further. And it puts huge demands on suppliers to figure out ways to economically develop and, and deliver those services. And, I, and it, so none of this is you know, all that revealing, but I, I guess it's my way of saying that um, because none of us expects that anybody is going to start pouring a bunch of new money into libraries or in academe in general, we need to learn to accept that in fact, like it or not, these consolidations are likely to continue to take place. Eventually they end they will end in book selling because there won't be anybody left to acquire. There will be one company left standing or it'll go the way of the buggy whip and disappear completely and, and then something new that we all need to acquire and provide will go through that same consolidation. And I don't think that that's necessarily pessimism on my part as just saying, like it or not, and with all the downside that comes with it, this is a reality that I think for all of us, we're just going to have to accept. Three minutes for any last closing comments. Well, yeah, I mean, um, what what we, I mean, we in my business we're under constraint as well. So there's lots of areas I'd like to publish into, but I can't because um, I just don't have the resources. Um, so um, what we found is, you know, using data analytics and insight and a good governance structure to make choices. So be selective. Um, and so what we're, I'm pitching the talk we're doing tomorrow, but what we're doing now is all this technology and portfolio tools that we use internally, we're now sharing with all our librarians. So to help you guys save money and spend less, and also potentially link that to more flexible business models so you can drive more access uh, for less money. So the, what we're trying to do as publishers, and I'd like to see other publishers do it, is be a lot more transparent with the data, create a much more liquid marketplace in terms of flexible business models so people can actually start choosing on things that matter for their university. Well, I'll just say for my closing remarks that I'm excited, I'm happy at the seat I find myself sitting in here in 2015, working now for a company that has resources um, encompassing technical services, library management system, discovery, uh, copyright management, CIPEX, recently acquired company, now uh, a, part of, a part of ProQuest. Print book capabilities, ebook capabilities, vast ebook capabilities. So the parts are there, and I am happy to be one of the people uh, responsible for putting them together in a way that uh, benefits many of you. Pretty good? Yeah. Good. Great speech.